Dan Kreis, I'm the lead pastor here. If you're joining us online or on the app, be sure to fill out the digital connect card there and let us know that you're here and how we can pray for you. And if you're here in person and you have our app, you can go ahead and pull that out and put in any prayer requests that you might have. We pray together as a staff every Tuesday morning for those. So we would love to be praying for you. Uh, and we are kicking off our new series on earth as in heaven. And if you have ever spent any time in a foreign country at all, if you've ever lived in a foreign country, even traveled or spent an extended amount of time in a foreign country, you know what it's like to feel like a stranger in a strange land, where you suddenly, Maddie's telling us, she, she knows, uh, you know, because you realize like, oh, wait a second, what I think of as normal and ordinary and all the customs, they're different. And so I learned this when I lived in New Zealand for a bit, and I thought, you know, Going to New Zealand, I didn't think it would be all that different, even though it's literally on the other side of the world, but it's mostly white, so, you know, I would fit in, and it's mostly wealthy, and they speak English, so I thought, it, you know, how much culture shock could there be? I'd been in other countries where I didn't know the language, and it was totally different, and I thought, it won't be so bad, and I realized, oh no, it's still foreign land, and very different, and in large and small ways. So one way is that they drive on the opposite side of the road. So my friends and I had bought a Honda Accord that was older than we were, and we would drive this around, and when you go in a roundabout the opposite way, it is mind-blowing. There were definitely times where we were like, I don't know how close to get to the middle of the road, you just realize how different it is. Or then food, there were so many different food things. Like, there are more sheep than people in New Zealand, so everything is made out of lamb, everything. You order a hamburger, it is a lamb burger. You order french fries, it was, they were fried in lamb fat. And so everything tastes like lamb, and I learned I don't like lamb very much, not very good. And even like the hamburgers, if you order a hamburger, which is a lamb burger, they also put things like the, the standard New Zealand hamburger comes with a beet, an egg, and a pineapple, slice of pineapple on it. And you're like, that's weird, that's weird. Cereal, you'd go to the grocery store and you just want a normal box of cereal, everything's muesli. There's no normal cereal. I was like, what is all this weird oat flakes with dried fruit? Or uh, the other big difference in food is ketchup. Their ketchup's very sweet, very different. So if you went to McDonald's and ordered french fries and you wanted ketchup, American ketchup was such a rare commodity, they would only give you two ketchup packets. And anyone who's ever eaten a thing of fries, you know, you use more than two ketchup packets. So that was, like, that was totally different. And then, even though we spoke English, our language was not always the same. For example, I was with a friend and we were walking across the street and she was from the Bronx in New York City and I was from a very small town in New Hampshire that didn't even have a stoplight. And so she was a city person, I was not. And we're crossing the city street and she's jaywalking. And I'm like, behind her, I'm like, I don't think that we should do this. This doesn't seem like the right thing to do. And she's like, it's just, it's fine, just, just keep going. And as we're crossing the street, a police officer pulls us over for jaywalking and starts talking to us and he gets out of the car and he's like, getting real mad, and then at one point he goes, you think it's pretty sweet as to, to cross the street. He said sweet as, as in sweet as honey, right? But I didn't know that that's what he said, so I thought, this police officer is so mad that he is swearing at me. That's what's happening here. It wasn't until later that friends were like, oh, no, 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 that's a, that's a saying around here. So all of these ways, I realized I don't actually fit in. This is not my home, and as much as I loved New Zealand, I loved living there, I had so much fun, there, there were moments where I was homesick, where I longed to go back to where I felt things were normal for myself, where I understood the customs and the practices, where I felt like I belonged. And that's what home is really about, right? Home is the place where you feel like you fit in. Home is the place where you feel like, I 
understand how this works. I feel like I am myself and I know the customs and the practices and it all feels normal to me. And when we're homesick, it's because we're separated from that. We're at a distance from that and we start to feel distressed and we start to feel lonely and we long for comfort, we long for normal. And as Christians, we're told that we should be living with that longing for home all the time. That this earth isn't really our home in the way that it currently is set up and that we should have a spiritual homesickness. And when we begin to understand that, it starts to make sense of our experience here. Because all throughout the New Testament, we're told over and over again that our home is not here, our home is in heaven. Jesus, he says this of his disciples, I have given them your word, and the world hates them because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but to keep them safe from the evil one. They do not belong to this world any more than I do. And Jesus says that he doesn't belong to the world and that his followers, because of that, also don't belong to the world. And sometimes they might even find themselves at odds with the world because the world is ruled by the evil one. And so that doesn't line up with what it means to follow him and his rule. And then the author of Hebrews says this, for this world is not our permanent home. We are looking forward to a home yet to come. And so what the author of Hebrews is saying is this is not a lasting home. And they say we're longing, we're longing for that permanent home. And that word longing, it means to have a very strong desire for or an unwavering orientation towards a goal. And so what the author here is saying is we have this, this strong desire that we orient our whole lives around for a permanent home that isn't the home that we're, that, that we're currently in. And then Peter, one of Jesus' disciples, when he's talking to a church that's learning the way of Jesus, he says this to them, dear friends, I warn you as temporary residents and foreigners to keep away from worldly desires that wage against your very souls. And he's saying, because you are to live as if you're only here temporarily, that you're foreigners, you're strangers in a strange land, and so the ways and the customs of the world are not your ways and customs. They should feel a little bit odd to you. You should look different. And so all of this tells us this is not your home. The world is not your home. And so when Jesus teaches us to pray, when his disciples ask, teach us to pray, he tells them to start their prayers like this. Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as in heaven. So we're to pray for God's kingdom to come. We're to pray for God's will to be done. But he gives us this really powerful statement that is literally translated like this. As in heaven, so on earth. As in heaven, so on earth, meaning that earth, we long for earth to reflect the reality of heaven. How heaven is set up, that's what we want to see here on earth. Because heaven is our home, it's our norm, it's our starting place. Not here, not the ways of the world. And so with this prayer, Jesus tells us to be homesick for heaven. To be homesick for heaven. To say something here just doesn't quite work for me. I don't quite belong. And unlike when we're homesick in another country, you know, we're homesick in another country because it's different, right? It's not necessarily right or wrong, it's just different. But being homesick for heaven, we realize something's not right here. Something's not right in the world. It's, things aren't as they should be. Because you know what? I should be in a home. I'm, I'm, I'm meant to be in a home without fear without sin, and without sickness, and without death. That's what I'm intended to be. And so we are homesick for heaven. But sometimes we have to wonder, what do we mean by heaven? Right? What does that even mean? It's hard to long for and be homesick for a place you've never been. Right? I've never, you, haven't, you haven't gone there. You haven't seen it. And sometimes it feels very ethereal, or it even feels like a fantasy. And I want to tell you today, heaven is not a place in the sky. Right? It's not this cloud kingdom in the sky. And when we start to get our minds around that, we can start to get homesick for this home that we're actually intended to be a part of. And we can pray with that longing that Jesus prays with. You know, as in heaven, so on earth. 
as in my home, so here in my temporary home. And so what do we mean by heaven? You know, that's a very broad topic, and I'm going to touch on it a bit today. You might have more questions. Our podcast, We Need to Talk, is starting back up. Text your questions about heaven. Our first episode is going to be, We Need to Talk About Heaven. So I'm sure that this will prompt some questions for you. But when we talk about heaven, we are talking about a spiritual dimension, the spiritual dimension where God reigns, where God is completely in control, where God's will is done, where God always gets his way, right? And we know that there are other spiritual realm, realms where that's not the case. That's what we would call the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of evil, where we know that evil gets its way. And evil forces aren't, aren't subject to what God wants. But heaven is the place where God's completely in charge. And when we talk about heaven and as a spiritual realm, realm, part of the reason why it's so hard to understand what we're talking about is you can't see it. Right? We can't see the spiritual realm. But heaven is not far away. It's not a galaxy far, far away, somewhere out there that maybe we'll float up to one day. Heaven is this spiritual realm that lives right alongside our physical realm. And so that's why we see the impact of the spiritual realm, but we can't physically see the manifestation of it. That's what we're talking about. And heaven, truthfully, is full of mystery. Right? Even, even the way that we talk about it in the scriptures, it's full of mystery. And we're given metaphor to understand heaven. This is why Jesus speaks in parables over and over again to help us see heavenly realities in ways that we could comprehend it, and things that we, our ordinary lives, that we can touch and see. So the kingdom of heaven is kind of like this. And the, the biggest metaphor that we're given for heaven is that of kingdom. And when we're talking about kingdom as a metaphor, we're talking about power, and we're talking about reign, we're talking about rule, we're talking about whose will gets done, who's in charge. And so when we're talking about the kingdom of heaven, we're talking about the reign of God, the power of God, where God is in charge. And that brings us into what's known as two kingdom theology. And two kingdom theology simply means there's two kingdoms. And we see it throughout scripture. There's the kingdom of the world and there's the kingdom of heaven. And they're not the same. They don't operate the same. They don't value the same things. And so when we talk about the kingdom of the world, we're talking about uh, a whole kingdom that operates upside down and totally opposite of the way the kingdom of God works. They, they don't get intertwined. No kingdom of the world is bringing about the kingdom of heaven, right? No kingdom of the world. It doesn't matter how just the government system is. It doesn't matter how much you like the people in charge or not like the people in charge. There's no kingdom of the world that is bringing about the kingdom of God because they're two completely separate kingdoms. That's what we mean by these two kingdoms. And throughout church history, we've been given four descriptions of the kingdom of heaven, four ways to understand it that are based in scripture they give us a better picture of what we're talking about when we talk about the, the reign of God, the rule of God, and how this is different than the kingdom of the world. And so the first picture, the first description that we're given of the kingdom is what's known as the upside down kingdom. The upside down kingdom. The kingdom of the world is set up, if you think about a pyramid, right, all the power is concentrated at the top. And whoever's at the top, whether that's in a business or a government, whoever is at the top, they have the most power, the most influence, and everyone below them serves them, serves their vision, serves their interests, and everyone's trying to get up to the top, right? We talk about climbing the ladder. You know, what's my upward mobility here in this organization? That's how kingdoms of the world are set up, and often power is self-serving. It's what is it in, what's in it for me, how am I going to benefit? How am I going to get my way? But the kingdom of God flips that, right? And rather than an upward mobility, it's a downward mobility. That, the, that, that instead of power over, it's power under. And the power is concentrated at the bottom. And rather than everyone else serving the person at the top in order to get their interests and needs met, er, the person at the bottom serves everyone else. The kingdom of God is based on power under Jesus, when he's talking about this with his disciples, he says this, but Jesus called them together and said, you know that the rulers of this world lord it over their people and officials flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you, it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first among you must become your slave. For even the son of man came not to be served, but to serve others and give his life as a ransom for many. And so this upside down kingdom, it flips 
upside down everything that we know, that in order to lead, you serve. In order to live, you die. In order to win, you sacrifice. So the kingdom of God, it operates differently than the kingdom of the world. And then the next picture of the kingdom that we're given is what's known as the peaceable kingdom. The peaceable kingdom. Every kingdom of the world expands through conquering and violence. Every kingdom of the world expands through conquering and violence. G the people in Jesus' time would know this because they lived in the Roman Empire. And the way the Roman Empire expanded is that they went in and they conquered other lands. And it was known as the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome, and the peace of Rome. And it was a very peaceful time for a lot of people. As long as you followed everything that Rome told you to do and you didn't make any trouble, otherwise they'd kill you. Right? The way that the peace of Rome was held was through the threat of violence. And we see the same thing today. Every kingdom that's trying to expand itself does it through war and violence and conquering. It's what we see with Russia and Ukraine right now. We've seen war after war after war, even in my lifetime. And we live in a country where we invest so much in our military. Why? Because we believe that the threat of violence is what keeps us safe. That's how the kingdom of the world works. The kingdom of God is different. It is the peaceable kingdom. It is the only kingdom that expands through peace, not violence. It's the only one. At Jesus' birth, you know, we hear the angels, the host of angels that show up and start singing. That, is, that word there is a legion of angels. It's a military term. A, a legion of angels shows up, and what do they declare? They declare peace. God is bringing peace. That's, what, that's how God's kingdom expands. And, and then Paul goes on to say that's the whole point of what Jesus has done. It's the whole point of the kingdom. He says, for God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ, and through him God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. The kingdom of God is the only kingdom that does not inflict violence on others. It's the only peaceable kingdom. In fact, we see that with Jesus, that the way the kingdom expands is not that he inflicts violence on his enemies, but that he suffers the violence of his enemies. He absorbs all of that violence, and he defeats it when he ri rises from the grave. That's how the kingdom of God expands. It's the only kingdom that works that way. It is completely different than any kingdom of the world. Heaven is free of violence because all violence is a result of sin, and heaven is free of sin. There is no violence in the kingdom of heaven. It's the peaceable kingdom. And then the author of Hebrews says this, since we are receiving a kingdom that is unshakable, let us be thankful and please God by worshiping him with holy fear and awe. And so that third picture that we get of the kingdom is the unshakable kingdom. The unshakable kingdom. And that word unshakable means it cannot be moved. It cannot be thrown into chaos or disorder. It's stable and firm. That's the unshakable kingdom. And we know that the kingdoms of this world are very shakable. Again, in my lifetime, many nations have changed their name, their boundaries, their borders. We've seen governments toppled and overthrown. We've seen empires fall apart. Right? We, we know that. We know that this is how it works in the kingdoms of the world. And that's why we, we always are on the defense to see what enemy is out there threatening our freedom, threatening our ways. Right? That's how kingdoms of the world work, good or bad, that's just the way it is. But the kingdom of God doesn't work that way because nothing can threaten the kingdom of God. There is no power that can come against it because what we see is in Jesus, his victory on the cross is full and complete. It's all done. Paul gives this image of the kingdom. He says, he canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. And the image that Paul is drawing on here is actually a Roman military victory parade. Because when the Roman Empire, which would expand through violence and come in and conquer another land because they wanted it, right? they felt that they were entitled to, to continue to expand their way of life, when they would come in, they would round up all the defeated leaders and they would march them through the Roman Empire to show, look, look at, we have disarmed them. They have no power. And it was a march towards their death. That's what that was. And so that's the same image that Paul is giving us about the kingdom of God, that when Jesus came and he, he disarmed 
the the forces of evil because their ultimate their ultimate weapon is death. That's the thing. That's what keeps everyone in line, right? That's what violence is really about. We'll kill you. We'll kill you if you get out of line. And so Jesus, he took all that. Their ultimate weapon, they threw it at him, and he defeated it when he rose from the grave. And so he, Paul says he put them to shame. He publicly shamed them. And now he's marching them to their death because we're told that the final enemy to be defeated is death, that death will be put to death because of Jesus. So Jesus is marching these forces of evil through the streets, showing that they, they've been completely disarmed because of the cross. That there is no power that can stand against the unshakable kingdom of God. Nothing can shake it. And then the last image that brings us into that last image, which is the eternal kingdom. The eternal kingdom. And eternal means that which has no end. That which doesn't end. That which will never cease. That, what, that, that which is everlasting. And Paul says this about this eternal kingdom. He says, I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, and nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. And he says the kingdom of God is imperishable, meaning it is not subject to the effects of time and decay. And we know that even the grandest empires in the world, the most beautiful buildings that we've ever built are subject to time and decay. Right? You can go to places where the Roman Empire were, and there's just ruins left. But the kingdom of God is not subject to that. It's eternal. And so Paul says we have to be changed. We have to be changed, that we are no longer subject to time and decay. Our very bodies have to be changed. And the, the gift that Jesus continues to talk about and his followers afterwards says, I'm offering you eternal life, life without end. And not just life that goes on with, you know, in endurance, but also good, abundant life, kingdom life. And so when Jesus tells us to long for heaven, to pray for the kingdom to come, this is the kingdom that we're praying for. We are praying for the upside down, peaceable, unshakable, eternal kingdom. Like that's our home. That's where we belong. That's where our allegiance lies. And so you know, we are called to be homesick for heaven because we are meant for heaven. And Jesus gives us a glimpse of what that looks like. But I want to go back to what Jesus teaches us to pray and notice what Jesus does not teach us to pray. Because Jesus does not teach us to pray, Heavenly Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Take us to heaven. Take us out of earth and bring us to heaven. And this is one way. We're going to talk about two ways that the church has gotten heaven wrong. The first way is that we have made the whole thing, the whole point about going to heaven. Have you ever been asked, do you know where you're going to go when you die? Right? The whole point is getting into heaven. And we, we, when we do that, when we emphasize heaven is a place where we escape this earth and we go to one fine morning, I'll fly away, right? what starts to happen is what you do here doesn't really matter. What we do on this earth doesn't really matter other than you better follow the rules so that you get in. Right? You don't want God to get mad at you because when you reach those pearly gates, you want to make sure that you get in. And I want us to think logically about this. If, you, if we really believe... The whole point is just to get into heaven, to leave this earth behind, which doesn't really matter, and get into heaven. What we would do, the better witness would be when someone accepts Jesus and they get baptized, we baptize them and then we hold them under, right? And we just let them go, right? Like, that's a better sign. All these cults that are like, let's all take the Kool-Aid because we're going somewhere else, we don't believe that. We actually don't believe it. There's part of you that's like, no, 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 I, that's crazy. I'm not going to be part of something that does it. But that's what we've turned the gospel into is that it's just about getting out of here. But that's not our hope. That is not the picture of heaven that we're given in the scriptures at all. Because the promise, the hope that we have is not to get out of here and go there. It's that all of this gets transformed. That one day heaven and earth are going to merge and they'll both be made completely new. That's the hope of heaven. That's what we're longing for. That's what we are homesick for. That's what we're praying when we say on earth as in heaven. Not get us out of here so we can go to heaven. And suddenly you have to start thinking differently if actually what you do here matters. If it, it's not just about following the rules so you get in someplace. And Kurt Thompson, he says this. We start to rethink about heaven. He says, it demands that we work to envisage our story, not as one in which God points out our sin, merely in order to forgive us, so that we should, should we agree to this arrangement, we will go to heaven when we die. 
nor does he identify our wounds and shame in order to heal them simply so that we will feel better about ourselves. Rather, he is transforming us, creating us anew to recommission us to do the work of new creation along with him. In this sense, God sees us not as problems to be solved or broken objects to be repaired, but as beauty on the way to being formed. That's the picture. Heaven is way more than a Disneyland in the sky that, you get to, that bad people get to go to because of Jesus. It's way more than people who get forgiven because they got the right formula, you said the right words, you got the magic words together and now you're forgiven. It is way more than fire insurance when people talk about heaven this way and the gospel that way. That heaven is not about waiting for everything to be destroyed. That's not our hope. It is waiting for everything to be redeemed. Every single thing. That's our hope of heaven. So that's one way that the church has totally gotten heaven wrong. Is that we think it's way out there and this doesn't matter and we're just waiting to go there. But the other way that the church has gotten heaven wrong is that we begin to think, oh, we're bringing heaven about. Right? All of our good works and our worldly uh, systems of battling and justice, all of these things are bringing about heaven. And this is known as the myth of progress, that we are making the world better. And w if we have the right policies and the right practices and we believe the right things, then you know what? The world's going to get better and we will eradicate evil and the kingdom of God will come. We're establishing the kingdom of God. That's our job. And your good works matter. And we're going to talk about that more in just a minute. The good things you do matter, but you're not going to bring about the kingdom of God. That's not our job. The kingdom of God is outside of us and it's going to come in in full radically one day. So we will not eradicate all of the evil in the world, no matter how good your policies are, no matter how good your practices are, no matter who you vote in or what what things and what bills you support, we are not bringing about the kingdom of God. We are working towards the kingdom of God, and I'll distinguish that in just a minute. But the kingdom of God is going to come from outside. And the truth is we live in what's known as the now and the not yet. The now and the not yet of the kingdom. The kingdom of God is right now. It's right now because Jesus broke in to our world. His resurrection happened, and he started new creation. And so his ways are are moving forward. And when we align ourselves with him, we are bringing about that we are advancing his kingdom agenda. We are part of what his ministry is. So yeah, the kingdom of God is at work right now, but it is not yet. It has not come in full yet. We are waiting on the kingdom of God because the truth is we still experience all the realities of sin, right? We still experience sickness and death. Our bodies break down, our relationships break down, our homes break down, and eventually we're all gonna die. That's what's going to happen. And so we live in the not yet of the kingdom. And Jesus gives a great parable about this in Matthew 13. It's called the parable of the weeds. And he talks about how there's this farmer. He goes and he plants really good seed. But over the night, an enemy comes and plants weeds at the same time. And they start to grow. And his servants, these farmer servants, realize what's happening. They see the weeds and they go to the farmer and they say, well, should we pull up all these weeds? Like, who did this? And the farmer goes, an enemy did this. But no. Don't pull up the weeds yet, because if you pull up the weeds, you'll also damage all the good crop. They just need to grow side by side, and at the harvest, it'll all get sorted out. And it gives us an image of what's actually happening right now, which is both kingdoms, the kingdom of the world and the kingdom of God are growing side by side. And so the kingdom of the world that is ruled by power over, that is full of injustice and sin and greed, that's subject to death and decay, that is growing right alongside the kingdom of God that is broken in and the goodness that's happening. And so when it, we're called to be homesick for heaven, it doesn't mean that we're homesick to just get out of here and leave all this behind, and go someplace, some celestial city in the sky that's so much better, you know? And it doesn't mean that we start to make heaven here on earth that we assume this is, this is our home and we just kind of, this is what we're doing, right? It means something so much more than that. It means we're longing. We see it now, and we're longing for the fullness to come. And so what do we do then, right? Cool, that's our, that's our heaven. That's what the kingdom of God is. What do we do? What does that look like? And Kurt Thompson, he talks about how while we're waiting for everything to be transformed, we're, we're waiting right now. He says, first, we are communities practicing for heaven. When we gather together in the name of Jesus, we are practicing for that reality. But this is my favorite 
phrase that he uses. He says, we create outposts of goodness and beauty in this world. We create outposts of goodness and beauty. And an outpost is a, it's a camp or a station that's far away from home base. Right? It's not near there. It's, it's far away. It's a dispatch. It's dispatched for a purpose. Right? And so to, to point to the greater thing that it's far away from, that it's at a distance from. And so N.T. Wright talks about how every time we do something good or beautiful, right, when we create these outposts of goodness and beauty that point to the kingdom that we're waiting for, that we're far away from, but all the goodness and beauty we're waiting to come from that kingdom, everything good and beautiful that we do is going to be somehow caught up in the new creation. And he says this, you are not oiling the wheels of a machine that's about to roll over the cliff. You are not restoring a great painting that's shortly going to be thrown on the fire. You are not planting roses in a garden that's about to be dug up for a building site. You are, strange though it may seem, almost as hard to believe as the resurrection itself accomplishing something that will become in due course part of God's new world. Every good and beautiful thing that we do in these outposts of goodness and beauty will be caught up in God's new world. And, and he talks about how the resurrected body of Jesus shows us what that, what that means. Because Jesus, he doesn't just abandon his body and become a spirit. Right? He's not like, well, peace out, I'm going to heaven. You know, don't have to do this stuff anymore. And he doesn't come back in the same body, the same body that is subject to death and decay. He comes back in a body that's been changed, that's been transformed. Somehow it takes the matter of his old body and it changes it into a new matter. That's the promise of new creation. We're told that's the first fruit. That's the beginning of what God's going to do when he brings the kingdom in full, when heaven and earth are merged. We see it first in Jesus. That's what we're longing for. So N.T. Wright, who goes on to say, every act of love, gratitude, and kindness, every work of art or music inspired by the love of God and delight in the beauty of his creation, every minute spent teaching a severely handicapped child to read or walk, every act of care or nurture or comfort and support for one's fellow human beings and for that matter, matter one's fellow non-human creatures. And of course, every prayer, all spirit-led teaching and every deed that spreads the gospel builds up the church, embraces and embodies holiness rather than corruption and makes the name of Jesus honored in the world. All of this will find, it will find its way through the resurrection power of God into the new creation that God will one day make. Everything you do that is good and beautiful, that is inspired by the goodness and beauty that we're awaiting from the kingdom of God, it will all be caught up in the new creation. And it will be transformed, it will be made new, and it is a mystery, and yet that's our hope. Our hope is everything will be redeemed. Everything will be made new. And so what you do here on earth matters, not just right now, but for eternity. It matters for eternity, and we are called to set up these outposts of goodness and beauty. We've been dispatched into the world to set up these outposts. Sometimes I refer to them as bright spots, to create bright spots in the world that point to something so much bigger than us. But we're called to do that, and we do that in every realm of life, every single realm, in your relationships, in your friendships, in your marriage, with your children. You are creating outposts of goodness and beauty when we live into the kingdom. In your work, in your, in your office, in your cubicle, on your bus if you're a bus driver, behind your register if you work in retail, everywhere you are, you can create an outpost of goodness and beauty. In the school, students, at your lunch tables, you create outposts of goodness and beauty. In your classrooms, teachers, you know, teams, if you are, whether you are a member of the team or you are a leader of the team, you create outposts of goodness and beauty. Everything you create that is good and beautiful, every song, every story, every dance, every painting, every invention, your garden, it is all an outpost of goodness and beauty. This community right here, 
A community that is practicing for heaven is an outpost of goodness and beauty. Every worship song we sing together, every prayer that we pray together, every time we greet someone who walks through that door, every time you serve someone, whether that is from making coffee to holding a crying baby to working with our youth to singing on the stage, whatever that is, you are helping to create an outpost of goodness and beauty. I love how Andy Stanley talks about the church. We are a family expecting guests. You know, we are creating a place that um, invites others to be part of God's goodness and beauty. We are pointing to something so much bigger than ourselves. And when we set up these outposts, whether in your house, in your neighborhood, in your workplace, here, collectively, it reminds us we are far from home. We are far from home. And we long for it. We are homesick for it. But we have been dispatched with a purpose that we have a purpose here on earth. And so how do we do that? How do we live into that? What does that look like to live into heaven as our home? And we're given three roles in scripture, citizen, ambassadors, and heirs. Citizens, ambassadors, and heirs. And that first one, citizens, it's about where you dwell, where your allegiance is. We're told you've been transferred from one kingdom and brought into another. And you are now part of the kingdom of heaven. You're part of the kingdom of light. You are under God's reign. And Paul says this, but we are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives, and we are eagerly awaiting him to return as our savior. And so as a citizen, that is about your responsibility. You are responsible to whatever place you are a citizen to. You are responsible to follow the rules and the regulations of that place, right? To be a good citizen means that you follow the collective rules, but it also means, it goes beyond that. It means that you are making positive contributions to be a good citizen in the world means that you care about your neighbor, that you are bringing things that make everything better. That's what it means to be a good citizen, that you're bringing your gifts and your talents and your resources to make the world better, to make where you dwell better. And so when we say that we're citizens of heaven primarily, it means that the ways of the world are not our ways, that we live by the rules and the customs and the laws and the regulations of heaven, which is the way of Jesus, which means we love our enemies. And we serve those even if we don't feel like serving others. And we offer forgiveness and mercy, that we value the treasure of heaven and not the treasure of the world, that we work to bring reconciliation about. That's, that's what it means to be a citizen of heaven. And so when we see that as our primary citizenship, we start to say the ways of the world aren't your ways. So it doesn't matter if you come from a family where there's all sorts of toxic patterns and behaviors, you don't get to participate in that. That's not your way. It doesn't matter if everyone else is lousy. You don't get to be lousy. It doesn't matter if you work in a place where people are passive aggressive and they don't help one another and they gossip about each other. Who cares? You don't participate in that. You, that's not your kingdom. You operate under different rules. It doesn't matter if your neighbors are greedy or they're competing with one another and they talk about like, I did this or you know, are your kids potty trained yet or whatever that is, my, my kid made straight A's or they're an honor roll student. Who cares? That's not your competition. That, those are not your rules. You stand out. You create this outpost of goodness and beauty because you say, oh, I'm a citizen of a different kingdom. And that kingdom operates differently. But it's more than just being a citizen. Because being a citizen is about being responsible. We're also called to be ambassadors. And to be an ambassador is active. You have an active role to play. Again, Paul says this, for God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. So to be an ambassador is to represent an authority greater than yourself and to recruit people into that, whatever that is, to recruit them. An ambassador speaks and acts with an authority that's given to them. They're representing someone bigger than them, something bigger than them, right? Think about an ambassador from the United States who goes to a different country. They are representing the United States. When if you go to the embassy, right, it's under the laws and customs of the United States, even though there's an embassy in a different country. And here's the truth. Many of us have worked to be good citizens of the kingdom of heaven, and we have forgotten that we are ambassadors. We have forgotten that we have an active role to play, that we are meant to represent and recruit to the kingdom of God. Let me give you an example. Many of you have actually worked very hard to set up a family that is different, a family that is safe, 
and loving and you have a beautiful home and your kids are being raised a different way, but you know what? Do you have a seat open at your Thanksgiving table? Because I know most of us don't. Most of us don't, no, no, that's my family time. This is my time, you know, and like we're working to do this. Or do you have an extra room in your house? You know, do you as assume that your dining room table is not just meant for you, it's meant for someone else? Because that's what we're called to do. The goodness and beauty that you're creating in that outpost isn't just for you. And too many of us have like sit, sunk into like, this is for me, and God's redeeming me, and my life, and that is true, and that's where it starts, but that's not where it ends. We are called to be ambassadors. There should always be room for that outpost to grow in one way or another. We should have eyes up asking God, who are you inviting in? Who else needs to be brought in to this outpost of goodness and beauty to see that there is something bigger than this world? There's a, there's a different way to live, a home that they're meant for as well. And then... Alongside that, yes, we're citizens, and yes, we're ambassadors, but we are also heirs. We're heirs. And Paul says this in Romans, and since we are his children and we are his heirs, in fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory, but, we, but if we are to share his glory, we must also share his suffering. And so a citizen is responsible, an ambassador recruits and represents, but an heir receives an heir receives, an heir has a stake in a claim in that kingdom of God. And so it's the difference between a renter and an owner, right? If you're renting a place, if you're a renter, you're not thinking, how can I make this place better? What investments could I make to improve this space? No, you're like, I want my rights. You know, someone else is responsible to make sure that this place is good and that they do what I need. And you think very short term about a place. But if you're an owner, if you own that space, suddenly you're willing to make all the investments. The investments of money and time and energy, even if you know it's not going to pay off right now. You know, if you re replace your roof, you're not going to make that back in the next year. But you know, it's worth it because that's part of what it means to steward this place. It's mine. I own it. I have a stake in it and it matters. You are not a renter in the kingdom of God. It is not about your rights. Jesus never wants to make sure you get your rights. Make sure you get what's yours. No, he says, you are an heir in the glory that's coming. You are an heir in all the goodness and beauty that God is going to establish on this, on this earth. You have a stake and a claim in it. You're an owner in that kingdom of God. But you know what that means? You have to think long term. And you make the investments now. And just as much as we will inherit the glory, we're also going to have to suffer the short term pains and disappointments and consequences that come with that. When we live in that upside down kingdom. And we make investments financially, relationally, emotionally, spiritually that don't pay off right away. When we align ourselves with that kingdom and say, it's not just something that is out there that maybe I'll, I'll get a little apartment in. Oh no, it's mine, I have a stake in it. And so I'm gonna think long-term because I want it to be the best that it can be. I'm an heir to the kingdom of God. And so over the next six weeks, we're gonna be looking at what does it look like to set up these outposts of goodness and beauty that point to the good and beautiful kingdom that we're waiting for, that is ruled by the good and beautiful God that we love and that our allegiance is given to? What does that look like? And what does that look like when we're citizens and ambassadors and heirs in these outposts for some pretty challenging topics? Right? We're going to be looking at wealth. We're going to talk about money, and some of you are sweating right now, but we have to talk about money because too many of us have a very short-term view of money. We haven't seen what that means to invest in the kingdom. And we're going to talk about creation and how this world actually matters. We're not just waiting for it to be destroyed, that somehow it's all going to be brought up into God's new creation. We're going to talk about gender and race and war, and politics, all the things that we feel like, oh, you can't get near them, but you know what? The kingdom of God tells us to go straight into them and to live differently in the midst of those things, to set up outposts of goodness and beauty where all of those things, the way that we treat all of those things points to God's kingdom, the kingdom of heaven that is our home, that we are homesick for, that we long for. And during this series, we're going to we're gonna do a practice together. So there's two things. One, there are these cards. You know, we've been doing memory verse cards, but these ones are a little different. So everyone needs to grab one. There's some on the table, there's some on the chairs. You're gonna need this over this series. But I want you to pull out your phone right now. Pull out your phone. 
Don't look at all your text messages or all the emails that came in. Pull out your phone, and I want you to pull up your alarms. Pull up your alarms, because we're, we're all setting alarms for 11.02. And I suggest AM, not PM. You know, if you want to pray at 11.02 PM, that's fine. If you're not up at 11.02 AM. 11.02, and at 11.02, because this comes from Luke 11.2, and we're using the message version, says, Jesus says, he said, when you pray, say, Father, reveal who you are and set the world right. Father, reveal who you are and set the world right. And what I want to challenge you to do is either carry this around with you so that when it hits 1102 and your alarm goes off, you pull this out or take a picture of it and have it on your phone so that it is always with you at 1102. And at 1102, even if all you can say is, Father, reveal who you are and set the world right. If you're in the middle of something, that's all you can say. We are collectively going to long for our heavenly home. We're going to remember where we're actually called to be and who, who we are allegiant to, where we are a citizen. Remember that we are an ambassador and claim that we are an heir. And in that, we will remember that we are called right now here on earth to set up these outposts of goodness and beauty in everything you do that is good and beautiful. Everything that you do that points to the good and beautiful kingdom and the good and beautiful God, that matters now and in eternity. Let's pray. Gracious God, we love you and we're thankful for your kingdom. We're thankful that you've broken in and you've brought it now and we wait for it to come in full, Lord. And help us to live as those who have been dispatched into the world to point to our home, our good and beautiful home that we are waiting for, God, that you will bring and you will set the world right. And so as we wait, God, as we wait for that to come in full, help us to be homesick for heaven and to remember that we've been dispatched with a purpose. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.